Okay. Okay, good morning. Before we start, I want to speak to our YouTube friends right up front. This is kind of a disclaimer from the teacher concerning this lesson. As a class, we have for several years now been learning to look at the figures of the true and have an understanding of the figurative language. The reason I'm bringing this up is because this lesson and the next several lessons in Joshua has a lot of figurative language. And so I want to encourage you as you're following along on the YouTube station, if there's something that I say that perhaps you've never considered before, that you would put a bookmark in the YouTube, close it up, and ask God, what is it that's being expressed? The thing about the figurative language is this. Because we are New Testament Gentiles and not Old Testament Israel, we haven't been taught that figurative language. And sometimes it's really hard to lay a hold of why all the figurative? We're thinking to ourselves, what's the point? And the point is the figurative language. That's the point. So you have a literal text, but you have a figurative expression that God can express way more than just a literal text. So I just really want to encourage you, don't give up. Be strong and of a good courage. Ask the Lord what is being said and just shut it off. It's not like I'm going anywhere, you know what I mean? So you can just percolate on it, ask the Lord, and then just have the understanding that figurative isn't something necessarily that you can reason out. You can't go, oh, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The word is spiritual. The figurative language is spiritual. It really does take God to show us what it is he's saying. So I'm encouraging you, hang in there. All right? So, you ready to begin? Yep. Okay. So let's kind of think where we left off. The Israelites are getting ready to depart Egypt. And, and you be an Israelite this morning. I mean, I'm pretty excited, right? My family's been in bondage for a long, long time. <laughs> and God has heard the pleas of his people. And he's getting ready to deliver us. And the very first thing that he's going to do is he's going to tell us that before he gives us the instructions of the Passover, there's going to be a change of the calendar for the nation. Okay? Now, God had said, this shall be the first of the months for you. <clears throat> signifying to the nation Israel that they're on a separate calendar from the other nations. This is the first of the month for the, the, the first of the months for you. There are separate people. They're the Lord's covenant people and now they're going to get ready to be delivered out of Egypt. This month of the year, this first month of the year is spring. We think first month of the year we think winter. January or winter that's right, right? But for them, this first month of the year is the spring, and it's the beginning of new life being brought forth. That's the figurative. So here's the first month of the year. Here's a new life that's being brought forth. And figuratively, because it's referring to the covenant people, obviously now we're talking about the nation being brought forth in new life as a nation. We're a collective unit, all right? Now, as we learned from the figurative message of the stars with their signs of the first month, the nation Israel and the peoples of the earth from the Sea of Humanity are under the new jurisdiction, which is the sovereignty of the king. They're not literally, but looking at that first month, the luminaries of that first month in Pisces, Israel, who has been held captive, is about to be broken free. She's not going to be in bondage. And... The peoples from the Sea of Humanity, they're going to be under the jurisdiction of the new king, the sovereign king. Right? So here's our picture. This is what Israel is seeing in the night sky in terms of that first month in Pisces. Right? And the heavenly revelation is a pictorial of the far fulfillment kingdom age. Now, None of this has actually taken place yet, has it? No. But the luminaries are declaring it as so because that's how God sees it. <laughs> Here is the fulfillment, the far fulfillment of the kingdom age, declaring the end of God's plan. 
And those are the ways of God. Okay. First, he declares the end of the plan. He tells you all the way, this is how it is. And then he says, it's finished, and I'm going to proceed to fill in the details for you. Okay. That's the thing I love about God. He never leaves you in the dark. See, if you're in the dark, it's either you don't have understanding or God hasn't shared it yet. Okay. Now, the figurative, the language, fig, uh, the figurative language of the two pictorials, and by that I mean the pictorial of the first month, the revelation of the plan in the heavenly luminaries, and the Lord's Passover, which is what we're going to look at, act as a witness of the plan of a kingdom of sons of God. You have to take the two things and put them together, and then you have this beautiful picture. So here's the end, and then with the instruction of Passover, God is going to declare, this is what I'm planning on doing. Okay. So, are you in Joshua? Good, because I'm not. Okay. <laughs> so, They've had the circumcision, and the Lord says to Joshua in chapter 5, verse 9, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, whereof, or wherefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal, unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month, at the even, in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes, and parched corn, or first fruits, in the same self day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So that kind of lets you know. We're actually running parallel. We're thinking of the Israelites that are coming out of Egypt, and we're thinking about Joshua and his generation in Canaan. Okay? So, before we proceed into the Passover, I wanted to give you a little history about Passover. And you remember, as a society, as Gentiles in nature, we're lumpers. We read something in the text and we lump it all together and we go, got it. And we don't know what we got it, but we got something, right? So I'm thinking we need to really have an understanding of the history of Passover because I haven't celebrated Passover, have you? Yes. You have? Good for you. But just thinking about how does this all work? What does it mean? Why is he why is it doing that? Why does he do it this way? So the history of the Passover begins this way. The Lord's Passover, with its feast of unleavened bread, though not mentioned in Exodus, the book of Exodus, and recorded out of order chronologically in the book of Numbers, was celebrated only once in the wilderness. Now they celebrate it here before they get ready to go out, and then they only celebrate it once when they're in the wilderness. And that celebration, as a matter of fact, was celebrated with the erection of the tabernacle a year after the nation's departure from Egypt. So they have Passover, they go out into the wilderness, they erect the tabernacle, and they celebrate Passover. Okay. And with that Passover celebrated the year after, that's the last mention of Israel celebrating the Lord's Passover until the end of the wilderness journey with numbers, uh, with Moses preparing to die and the passing of the leadership to Joshua. <clears throat> so you have it celebrated in Egypt, you have it celebrated once in the wilderness, and then you have it here celebrated, okay? Now here's another interesting thing about Passover. All throughout the scripture, Depending on the text, it cons it c as it concerns the history of the nation, though the Lord's Passover is always celebrated on the 14th of the month, which is what we're going to look at in Exodus, the animals of lambs and kids of goats were not always the only animals offered. Okay. So, again, I'm speaking solely to myself. My understanding of Passover was it's a lamb. I didn't think about goats. Nor did I know that they offered bullocks or any other thing else. But you have that recorded in 2 Chronicles. So we're going to unlump, okay? Now, it also needs to be noted that the one-day celebration of first fruits, right? We have 
Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits. That one day celebration of First Fruits, included with the Lord's Passover and Unleavened Bread, came later with the establishment of the Levitical offerings and was not celebrated until the first celebration of First Fruits with the generation under Joshua in the land of promise. And you're thinking, well, how, why? Well, this of course is due to the fact that there are no crops to be planted or harvested in the wilderness. <laughs> As manna was the sustenance for 40 years. But also, there is a figurative pictorial to be revealed in that first celebration of first fruits. Isn't that fascinating? I thought it was really interesting. Alrighty then. So, now I'm too hot. Here we have this understanding, a little bit of history of, of the Passover, right? The other thing we need to have an understanding of is the Passover, the Lord's Passover, was not a Levitical offering. We, again, as Gentiles, are speaking for myself, I lump out all the offerings together. All the animals are the same, all the offerings are the same, they all came up at the same time. That's, it's, there you go. <laughs> so, the Lord's Passover was not a Levitical offering. Figurative within the message of the Levitical offerings, which were instituted in the wilderness, and not in Egypt, which is when the Passover was instituted, in those figurative messages of the Levitical offerings is the teaching of the person and the work of the covenant son. Each of the five offerings, the burnt, the meal, the peace, the sin, and trespass offerings, with their animal sacrifices, pointed to him and were fulfilled in him. See? And those offerings offered are in relation, listen to this, to the sons of Israel nationally as God's covenant people. So who are the Levitical offerings for? Israel. Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, the Lord's Passover is a mini pictorial, it's a mirror image of the plan of the covenant of eternal life. What's the issue with God? Eternal life. Eternal life. For whosoever will believe and receive of any of the sons of Adam, which would include the nation Israel, correct? They're sons of Adam as well, okay? And this Passover that's being described in Exodus, as we'll see, is first written here in the luminaries in Libra. See, it's first expressed in the stars with their signs, specifically in the sign Libra. Within the figurative message of the stars with their signs in Libra is the message of the household of the covenant son. See? God had a plan. He had a plan for a household of sons of God. And the house of propitiation, which is what the sign of Libra speaks about, is where God meets man's need of eternal life for the mortal body, because that's the plan, and righteousness for the soul. Now, God's plan, made in eternity, which is figured in the sign of Libra, Libra is the sign of eternity, and brought into time, is to have man in his image, after his likeness, a kingdom of sons of God. See? That's why I'm saying we can't lump everything together, because then we don't really know what we're looking at. And then we have a tendency, not, you probably don't, but I have a tendency to want to make the scriptures about me. Okay, so, the eternal covenant, which is declared in the luminaries, here is the eternal covenant. That eternal covenant is a legal contract between the parties of the councils of the Godhead. That's a legal contract. And the legal contract of the councils of the Godhead is in hope of eternal life. Planned in eternity, as Lieber declares, a hope of eternal life for a covenant of a household of sons of God. Now the word covenant has the meaning treaty, allegiance, an agreement. Thus, God's covenant, declared in the luminaries, 
to have man in his image, after his likeness, to save and call with the holy calling, whosoever will believe and receive, not according to their works, right? but according to his own purpose and grace, was given in Christ Jesus, the covenant son, before the world began. Okay. That is the gospel. Okay. Now you have all the details of the gospel in the word, but simply that's it. The plan is, sons of God, in bodies of glory, eternal life given for this seed. Okay. Hence, the Lord's Passover, the provision of the deliverance from the death of the firstborn, which we're going to look at it, is not an offering for sin. I bet you all thought this is an off. It's not an offering for sin. I'm going to say it again. The Lord's Passover is the provision of the deliverance from death of the firstborn. That means there's been a way out for the firstborn not to die. Okay. It's not an offering for sin, but a covering over. It's a covering over that firstborn creation. Mm -hmm. And the sign of that blood is a sign of deliverance from death for the firstborn with the possibility of redemption mm -hmm. unto salvation of eternal life through the provision offered, the Lord's Passover. If we make it something it's not, then we don't really know what it is we're looking at. God's saying, here's a deliverance out of Egypt. Here's a way for the firstborn to be delivered from death. And what I need for you to do is put blood on their doorposts and lintels. Now, putting blood on the doorposts and lintels does not save a man and give him salvation unto eternal life. It's not a redemption, it's a deliverance. But every time we read lamb as Gentiles, we go, sin, 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 right? And so we never really read what it's saying. So here is this deliverance out of Egypt, right? And what's interesting about the celebratory feast of the Passover is that there's neither thought nor mention of sin. See? If there's something that has to deal with sin, doesn't God de declare it? He's pretty like... This is a sin offering. This is a, this kind of offering. This is what needs to be, right? There's neither thought nor mention of sin in the Lord's Passover. The shed blood of the Lord's Passover is the figurative pictorial of the covering over of the grace of God for the deliverance of the firstborn and is confirmation of the testimony of the plan for the hope of eternal life in the sign of Libra. Okay. If God didn't do it all, would any of us be here? No. See, that's the picture. Here's the picture. There's a covering over. Now this morning, Kathy made me this cloud. We're trying to, it's a picture. It's not, okay, the, the Lord's Passover wasn't a cloud. But here's the idea. Here's this passing over of this creation okay, of humanity. Here's the passing over. I'm going to do this. I'm going to provide deliverance out of this creation of humanity with the possibility of that particular man taking the provision that I'm offering. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because with God, the issue is seed. Sons of God, eternal life. See? Who makes sin the issue? Man, Man does. See? And I'm not saying it isn't an issue. What I'm saying is, the issue is eternal life. See? So we have to put everything back in its order. So here in the celebratory feast, there's neither thought nor mention of sin. The shed blood of the Lord's Passover is the figurative pictorial of the covering over of the grace of God for the deliverance of the firstborn. Okay? If he didn't put blood on the doorpost and the lintel, who died? First firstborn. The firstborn. And it didn't matter firstborn animal, firstborn people, it died. If it belonged to that household, it was dead. And it didn't matter if it was Jew, Gentile, see? 
And when we start reading the text, you can see that God's specific in what, what who is going to strike the Egyptians. He says it. So your mind goes, well, if he's striking the Egyptians, how come the Jews have to put it on their doorposts? They're in Goshen. They're not even in Egypt. What's right? They're on the border. How come? What's the big deal? Because of the figure. See, it's the provision of deliverance out of. Hey, it's the provision for the firstborn. Now then, the Lord's Passover covered corporately the nation and any individual Gentile who applied the blood of the Lord's Passover to the doorposts and lintels of the house as a sign of deliverance in order that the firstborn be spared death. How do I know that? Because you have a mixed multitude that comes out with Israel from Egypt. So... If you're going to think this through, is God going to say, okay, my nation, you need to do the doorposts and lentils. I'm going to strike Egypt, and who doesn't have the blood, see the whole issues of the blood. If I don't see the blood, death of the firstborn. Okay. So what about that mixed multitude? How did they come out? They would have had to put blood on the doorposts and lentils, would they not? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Does it say that in the text? No, no it doesn't. But I don't want you to think I'm making it up, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> thus, as is clearly understood, the emphasis of the Lord's Passover is the deliverance of the firstborn from death. And that deliverance from death is through the death of the Lord's Passover. Because in Exodus 12, 13, the Lord says, when I see the blood... I will pass over you. See? That passing over is the figurative of the hope of the eternal life offered, that whosoever will might be redeemed. You think, well, how can I reconcile this in my mind? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay. Now, is that offered to everybody? Yes. Is that Passover extended out there? Yes. Okay. And there's no mention of sin. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, because I beat this thing to death, the next question that comes to your mind has to be, the firstborn is figurative of the creation of the son's of the first Adam. Mm -hmm. hey. There's only two household of sons, really. There's the sons of Adam and the sons of God. Okay. Now you do have the sons of Israel, but they come from the sons of Adam. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the firstborn that is being referenced here in Joshua and in Exodus is figurative of the sons born of the flesh of humanity, the creation of humanity. That creation of humanity, the firstborn, are born dead, their seed, right, in trespasses and sins, and they're condemned to death. So what do they need? Life. Okay. Man needs a body, a spirit being, a body of eternal life. The creator has the covering needed. Okay. Man is brought forth a soul of spirit being, clothed in a body of flesh, okay, that he might choose to become a son of God in the image of God and experience the rest of God forever through a union of love. See? Now, this first choice, this first birth is not a choice. See? And I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> well, you're here. I don't know what to tell you. Okay. <laughs> so, no, the first birth is not a choice. But the second is. See, the second is a choice. And man has been given the opportunity to be delivered out of that first creation and receive the eternal life offered in the Lord's Passover. Man has the privilege of being born twice. Now, the blood of the lamb or goat 
was a double pictorial of the substitute for the house. Okay. Figuratively of the eternal life and the way of escape from death provided by God's firstborn, the covenant son, the first begotten son of God. Thus, to the one choosing to be twice born, that one becomes a part of the second creation. Mm -hmm. okay. The new creation are sons of God. Be they the household of Israel or the whosoever will of the sons of Adam. Okay. Which is why you have a mixed multitude that comes out with Israel mm -hmm. from Egypt. Okay. I mean, God is so logical, isn't he? Mm -hmm. It's just that because it all gets lumped over, we don't know what it is that we're looking at. I don't. It takes, it takes a while to think this thing through and have God show you. So, what is the Lord's Passover? The seed Christ. Yes. That's the Passover. Yeah. See? Yeah. So turn with me now to Exodus 12. And hang in there with me, because I'm going to read up through verse 27. But think along, okay? And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, right there, that ought to tell you, right, it's a Passover. It's not a sin offering. Each person individually has to make a decision, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man, according to, the, to his eating, shall make you count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Does this tell you it's a corporate thing? It's the Lord's Passover and not a sin offering? Mm -hmm. Okay. And they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two sides of the posts, on the upper doorposts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night... Roast with fire and unleavened bread. With bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and his innards. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn it with fire. Does that tell you how holy the Lord's Passover is? Okay. And this is the way you're to eat it. You are to eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay. And I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy when I smite the land of Egypt. See? Again, they're in Goshen, which is on the border, but they still have to do it. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. It was very important. So for them to do it is the evidence they're believing the Lord's going to pass over them and they're going to be delivered. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall you put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And the first day shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And you shall observe it, the feast of unleavened bread,
For this same self day I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first of the month, on the fourteenth of the day, fourteenth day of the month, at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even the soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. I don't think they're supposed to eat anything with leaven. <laughs> in all your habitations you shall eat unleavened bread then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. When he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when you come into the land, which the Lord will give you according as he has promised, that you should keep the service. And it shall come to pass wherein your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. Okay, so here's a different kind of take on the Passover, right? Now then. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was eaten with the Lord's Passover on the 15th of the first month. The Passover was slain at even on the 14th. Then you roast it and you eat it on the 15th with the unleavened bread. The Lord's Passover and unleavened bread, the two are an in, in I can't say this word, in, intricately connected. Intricately. intricately. Connected, okay? So then you have to ask yourself, why is that? Because of what it pictures. The Passover and the unleavened bread. Can you separate? Mm -hmm. No, you cannot. See? Intrinsically, that's the word. Okay. One doesn't come without the other. See? It's always understood that way. But sometimes in the text, it's simply referred to as the Passover, and sometimes it's referred to as unleavened bread. But if you're eating unleavened bread, it's because you had the Passover. And if you're having the Passover, you're having unleavened bread. Now, as I said, the Lord's Passover, be it a lamb, a goat, bullock, right, was slain and roasted on the 14th. The whole assembly did it. And then eaten with the unleavened bread on the day of the 15th. Only. That's the only day it's eaten. One day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> then for six days remaining, the unleavened bread was eaten for a total of seven days consecutively. Now, this is where the figures come in, and it's really wrapping our minds, slowing our minds down. Okay, so you have the whole congregation slaying the Lord's Passover at evening. Does the Lord ever do anything in daylight? No, it's always in the evening and the morning is, you see what I'm saying? It's a pattern. He does the same thing over and over. So the Passover is slain on the 14th, roasted and eaten on the 15th, the evening of the 15th. It's always the evening and the morning. Evening it starts at dusk, okay? Now the ordinal seven, you're going to eat unleavened bread for seven days, but not the Passover. Just the one day for the Passover, unleavened bread for seven days. The ordinal seven is used as no other number in the scripture. Seven and its compounds occur in multiples in the scripture. And in scriptural numerology, the number expresses perfection or completeness. Okay. Now then, here are the figurative details of the unleavened bread. The issue with God is eternal life. The Lord's Passover, the covenant son is the life that satisfies God. 
The first begotten Son is the complete perfection of that which God purposed. Man in his image, after his likeness, a son of God. Okay. The unleavened bread figures the deathless body of eternal life of the begotten Son, the staff of life, the bread come down from heaven. God, spirit being of deity, raised, clothed in a body of flesh and bone, spirit life, eternal life. The life eternal, God, raised in a body, the seed, is that which satisfies both God and man. And this is understood in the figurative of first fruits. First fruits is considered the third of Israel's seven feasts and is celebrated the day following the Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread of the first month, which we would refer to as the 16th. Okay. Now briefly, I just wanted to give you the seven feasts because again, if you were an Old Testament Israelite and had been trained, in the figures of the true, you would have understanding. You could read one verse and go, know exactly what's being said in the figurative language. But we don't. Okay. And so sometimes this part, I'm going to be honest, is boring. Yeah. <laughs> you know, until we get past everything. It's one plus one is two, everything. We have to learn ABCs, all of this, so that we have a better understanding of what's being said. So we have seven feasts of Jehovah. They are Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Trumpets. The feast, the first fruits, uh, uh, the first feast of Jehovah has three events. Passover has Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. That's one of the feasts of Jehovah, or three. Okay. This festival is celebrated in the spring, which is initiated here with the covenant people exiting out of Egypt. The next festival of Jehovah is celebrated 50 days later. This is the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost. And you think, why doesn't he just keep the name what it is? It's very confusing, right? <laughs> it's like, if it's the Passover, why call it unleavened bread? And if it's unleavened bread, why call it the Passover? Because there's the joy of discovery when you're looking at the text of what God is sharing. So here we are 50 days later, and this Feast of Weeks is also known as Pente Pentecost. This is a summer festival. And this festival pictures the sowing of this incorruptible seed, the Word of God, and the harvesting, the ingathering of the seed of sons. That's the picture, figuratively, for Feast of Weeks. And then you have the last festival of Jehovah. The last festival of Jehovah also has three events. There are the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. So everything God does is with design and purpose, and order is everything. everything. Okay. Now, before we consider the figurative message of the offering of the first fruits, we need to consider God's specific timetable. This is where, as we proceed further along into Joshua and further along into the covenant, we're going to be talking about months, days, years. And normally when we read it in the text, we read it and go, who cares? And we keep moving. <laughs> right? But it's very important because God has a specific timetable. And he lays it out in a certain way because everything is prophetic. And it's figurative. So he can express who he is. Now God is not concerned with dates. His works are according to his day of weeks and months and years. Man has his days of the week. And God has his day of weeks. God's day of weeks are the result of the laws of the universe, often referred to as the laws of nature. God begins his day of weeks with day one. Then proceeding in numerical order, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then the Sabbath rest, day seven. Does that remind you of Genesis 1? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Now, there is a reason God names his day of weeks by number. 
The prearranged order of the numerology is significant because of the figurative expression of that ordinal, right, expressing that which God is doing. So when you understand the language of numerology, then you're saying day one, a true beginning. Day two, the number of witness. Day three, the resurrected of the seed. Seed. Day four, right? Four corners of the earth. Day five, the grace. Day six, the number of man. Day seven, the rest. Okay? Now, God does that because mathematical equations cannot be changed. See? Now, I'm going to say that sentence again, and I'm going to ask you to think about why he did that. Mathematical equations cannot change. Why do you suppose God uses mathematics? Because God never changes. Because God never changes, and man changes everything, right? So mathematical equations cannot change. Everything is in synchronized in a prearranged order in the universe. In the figurative language of numerology, of the ordinal of the day is the expression of what God is doing in terms of his eternal covenant as it is revealed by that ordinal. So when you read a number, day, see, they go into the land on day 10. What's day 10? That ordinal 10, does anybody remember? It has to do with it's the beginning of a new series. Okay. So there on day 10, here's the beginning of a new series. Well, what's the new thing that's happening? Well, Israel's going into the covenant land. Did you see what I'm saying? And then they're there for three days, and then they offer the Passover on the 14th, and then they eat the Passover and unleavened bread on the 15th. And then, you see? So when we're looking at numbers and we're thinking blah, 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 there's this picture, okay, which God can express in that figurative language. So, here's the mathematics, how it works. He begins with day one, right? In the figurative language of the numerology of the ordinal day is the expression of what God is doing in terms of his eternal covenant as is revealed by the ordinal. Beginning the cycle again with the second day of weeks, this is where it gets confusing, day one would be the eighth day of the month, are you with me, <laughs> okay? And day one of a new week. Okay. And what is seen in the breakdown of time within God's calendar is that time is interwoven with both the solar and the lunar. Okay. In the day, the solar is the emphasis with its continuous flow as the day begins and ends with dusk, the setting of the sun. The lunar is the cycle of days in couplets of sevens, day of weeks. Okay. Thus, this is how it works. God has four day of weeks. Okay with the cycle always beginning with a new beginning every eighth day, okay, with the completion of the cycle beginning and ending with a new moon. Now to us this doesn't mean anything, but the further we go on into Joshua, it's going to mean a lot in terms of the figurative language. Okay? Because not only does Israel understand what's going on in terms of the calendar, so do the pagans. They, they get it. We're on a whole totally different system and we don't even think this way. Okay. So, literally what is seen is literal time flows seamlessly through each calendar and each pictures a phase or facet of the revelation of the eternal covenant as seen in the figurative message of the zodiac with the stars and their signs. Which is really sad because it's not taught too much today. See, and so we miss a lot. So what do we have? Well, by the design of the Creator, if it's flowing seamlessly, what do you have? You have a figure of eternity without beginning and without end. See, here's his plan. He's just doing his thing. Right? Consequently, the first day of Passover, the day of unleavened bread, was a holy convocation. It was a holy day. It was a Sabbath rest. Okay? As was the seventh day of the week of Passover. Thus the beginning and ending of the Lord's Passover was holy. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a figure. 
because the plan of eternal life began in eternity past. There's the plan of eternal life began in eternal pa eternity past, right? Is holy. And then it's initiated in time with the seed of the woman, right? Well, what does that mean? It's holy. And then it's concluded, right, at the end of the age with the setting up of the kingdom. Well, what does that mean? It's holy. The whole plan is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the plan for eternal life. Now, first fruits was a one-day feast specifically associated with the Lord's Passover, celebrated on the day following the Sabbath of the first day. And I hate to word it like that, but that's how it's worded. So it's a practicing of thinking. Okay, so we're going to have first fruits celebrated on the day following the Sabbath of the first day. And first fruits, as we said, is connected to the nation of Israel's harvest in the land. Obviously, they don't have a harvest in the wilderness, do they? No. no. So here it is. Now we have first fruits. And it's connected to Israel's harvest in the land. As previously mentioned, there aren't any crops planted or harvested in the wilderness. So can you celebrate first fruits? No. Okay. Now the offering of the first fruits is the promise of the harvest of the resurrection. That's what you're offering. Here's the first fruits. We're hoping for more seed, right? More seed coming out from the dirt. Here is the promise, this offering of first fruits, of the resurrection of the seed grain buried in the earth to die. Is that a beautiful picture? Mm -hmm. okay. Now the thing about the first fruits is that they were offered unto the Lord for a sweet savor offering. Here they are. Now you'll remember from our study of the sweet savor offerings, the figure of the message of the sweet savor offerings is grace upon grace in the covenant son. Remember they offered him, they layered the, layered the offerings. So here in the sweet savor offering of the first fruits is the covenant son in the stead of man in perfect holiness. Now finally, there's one last detail that needs to be noted. And this took me a while when I was thinking this through because I'd been taught something other than what I'm going to share with you. <laughs> so as with other figurative pictorials, sometimes it's the elimination of the detail that is the detail. Okay. Hence is the elimination of the ordinal 16 mentioned in the Lord's Passover. There is no scriptural reference with any mention of first fruits and the 16th. Nowhere. But in our minds, because we're thinking it out 14th, 15th, and we're celebrating it the day after the Sabbath of the blah, 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 right? So then in our, our minds, we just go, it's the 16th. Well, there isn't an ordinal 16th that's attached to the first fruits. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that there are many harvests throughout the year not recorded in the scripture which would require a first fruit offering, not just the harvest associated with the Lord's Passover. I mean, how brilliant is God to do that? He doesn't put the date. I mean, it's on the 16th. He tells you the 14th, tells you the 15th, but doesn't name the 16th because there's a lot of harvests, and each one of those harvests require a first fruit offering. Okay? So, thus, here's this picture. As the offering of first fruits was a promise concerning the harvest, and harvests could be short or long, some could be last up to two months, and sometimes the harvests overlapped each other, which is what you have pictured with the barley and the wheat. Mm -hmm. eh? Everything connected to the harvest depended on the type of crop, the weather, the soil, the size of the field, and even the husbandman. Thereby, one has understanding of why there is the elimination of the ordinal 16. Seems like such a little thing, doesn't it? Like, you're getting kind of picky, Perry. Okay. I mean, who cares? God does. Okay. 
and it pictures something, and it's important. See? Also, the first fruits is figurative of the harvest of seed from every harvest, right? So you have first fruits of Passover, and then you have more first fruits, more first but you don't necessarily have Passover. It's a picture of something. It's a picture that from every age, seed will be resurrected from Adam until the end of the kingdom age. See? Always seed, always seed, always seed. Now, <clears throat> something else that's not mentioned in connection to the first fruit celebration is that you always had to bring a male of the first year as a burnt offering. Now, you don't have it recorded in Exodus. You think, well, wait a minute. That was a requirement. And depending on the text and the history and what you're looking at, see, that's why it's recorded the way that it's recorded, because there's certain pictures that God wants to express within that text. But always if you brought a first, first, first fruit offering, whether it was Passover or separately, you always brought a lamb of the first year. Okay. And you always brought that lamb as a burnt offering. It's a specific offering. It's not a sin offering. It's not a trespass offering. It, it's a burnt offering. It's a sweet savor offering. See? Okay. Now, there's three types of animals used in the sacrifice in connection to burnt offerings. You have herd, remember bullock, sheep, and goat. Those are the, of the flock. And the birds. But if you're going to offer a first fruit offering at Passover, you must bring a lamb, okay? a year old, as a burnt offering. Now, the thing about the burnt offering is that it was a whole burnt offering, meaning that the whole offering was consumed on the altar. So you're bringing a lamb with your ear of seed, your corn, right? and you're going to burn the whole lamb on the altar. See? Because the burnt offering figured the life offered as complete, nothing held back. All was offered to God. Mm -hmm. hey. With the exception of the hide. Only the hide of the animal was the priest's recompense. Now the hide of the animal is the skin. It's the covering of flesh. Do you see where we're going here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the first fruit offering, it was the lamb that was to be offered as a burnt offering. Okay. Now, what's the figure? Well, the covenant son was the first fruits, was he not? Yeah. He was the first fruits. He is the sweet savor offering of grace upon grace. God the Son, the Son of Man, the first begotten Son of God, in the stead of man in perfect holiness. Okay. He is the promise of the harvest, of the resurrection of seed grain buried in the earth. Okay. If he didn't raise, would we? No. no. See? He is the promise of the harvest of the resurrection of the seed grain buried in the earth, the seed bodies of flesh and bone, spirit life, eternal life. He is the promise of sons of God. Now, seen in the offering of the male lamb of the first year offered as a burnt offering with the first fruits is the consecration of righteousness, okay. the sanctification, dedication, and blessing of God to man expressed in the covenant son. What is there that you have that you have not received of God? Nothing. Hey? Can you give eternal life for yourself? Can you cleanse yourself from sin? What about righteousness? Do you have the power to rule over the enmity of your own thinking in and of yourself? No. See? Now the high of the burnt offering speaks figuratively of the clothing of skin, speaks figuratively of the body of glory, which is the priest's recompense, this case the priest being Jesus, here is a body of glory, his recompense, that's provided by the consecration of his righteousness. You see, God has to do it all. Mm -hmm. hey. Can you say that again? Please? I'll try. 
See, I was hoping to get on to chapter 6, but you can see why. <laughs> The skin, see that that skin, the height of the burnt offering, figures speak figuratively of the clothing. Here is your clothing. It's appointed once to die. What is this? This is a seed. What do you do with seed? Plant you plant it. Okay. Now you, the personal being, has an opportunity to become a son of God. So this covering is temporary, mortal, going to return to dust. What you need is a different covering. Right? Now this covering is the provision okay, of the seed Christ. This covering, when connected to the first fruits, expresses the figurative, it is finished. Okay? Here is the seed, here is the covenant son with his grain of seed for sons of God in bodies of glory. And those sons of God with bodies of glory will all be offered unto the Lord for a sweet savor offering. The thing about God is he never does anything from selfishly. See? It's like, I desire for sons of God. You know, we've said before, well, God doesn't have a need. He does. And that's to love. So I'm going to love, and I'm going to lavish this love in the provision of a body of glory. Now, contextually, within the text of Joshua, that which has been expressed figuratively is literally a reality for the generation under Joshua. It's finished. All that remains for Joshua's generation is to go forward and receive the land of promise been promised to Abraham and his seed. Encamped at Gilgal, the reproach of Egypt has been rolled away. Right? And the Lord's Passover, the first one celebrated in over 40 years, has been partaken of by the assembly, along with the first ever celebration of first fruits. I mean, think about all the things you've thought the Lord showed you this morning. It's like in two verses, you know? <laughs> but all the figurative text behind it and what it pictures, mm -hmm. see? And here they are, come out of Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness. These are the children of that generation that's perished. They've crossed over, and here they are. They're, there's their land, right? All that remains is for them to, to receive it, see? So as previously mentioned, the first Passover observed was the night of the departure from Egypt. And it was a sign of deliverance from the bondage of death of the firstborn with the possibility of redemption through the provision offered. The second time the Lord's Passover was celebrated was at the time of the erection of the tabernacle. Okay, Stop. This is where your mind goes, huh. Well, what is the tabernacle figure? The tabernacle, with its articles of furniture, figure the first coming of the covenant Son of God, come clothed in a body of flesh. Now, connecting the figurative pictorial of the celebration of Passover, the deliverance from death for the firstborn, with the possibility of redemption through the provision offered, with the figurative pictorial of the erection of the tabernacle, God, the birth son, come clothed in a body of flesh, oh, now all the details have been filled in. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Do you suppose they were taught this? Mm -hmm. Of course they were. Okay. Here is the details filled in on how the redemption of salvation of eternal life is to be accomplished. God's going to send his son clothed in a body of flesh. Well, now that takes us to this Passover in Joshua. This Passover celebration in the book of Joshua is figurative of the second coming of the covenant son. Okay. As the deliverer and redeemer of the bondage of death of the firstborn, his people Israel, right? because he is the first begotten son of God. He is the heir of the kingdom of God on earth. And what is he going to do? He's going to give it to them as an inheritance. Patrol. 
So, turn with me to Joshua 5. Who would have thunk it, huh? So, back at verse 10 again. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at the even in the plains of Jericho. What does that mean? They killed the Passover, right? And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. So they're, they're eating the Passover, the old corn, and the unleavened cakes, the, the unleavened bread. And what else are they eating? The first fruits. And they're eating all of that, what does it say? In the same self day, okay? So, on the morrow, after the preparation of the Passover, meaning the 15th, the nation did eat, all in the same day, the old corn of the land, unleavened bread, the cakes, with the Passover, as they had been instructed, right? And the first fruits, and the manna. Let's see, there's this whole picture, right? Now, Looking at the verse, because I'm a Gentile, not an Israelite, my mind goes, huh, because I've, I've looked at all these other figures. Well, the first fruits are not eaten on the morrow of the Passover. They're not eaten on the 15th. Clearly, it says in Exodus and in the Levitical offerings, one has to eat the first fruits. But they're obviously eating it on the morrow. See? They're not, they're not to do that, but they are. They're doing it anyway. So then my mind says to itself, self, it says, hmm, that's kind of curious. Why? I, I wonder if there's a figurative pictorial. I'm not saying, but you think maybe there might be? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See? Why eat the first fruits the same day as the unleavened bread? Isn't that the question? I mean, we've just gone through this whole thing. God is real specific. So why do that? See, what is seen, eaten on that day of the 15th, in the land promise, is the revelation of the accomplishment of the figurative. It is finished. Okay. It's this little picture here. Like, there they are, this generation. They've gone into the land. Now, we know, because we've read the end of the story, that they don't get all their land. But it's a picture, right? In figure... Joshua's generation of sons of Israel are figurative pictorial of the conclusion of the remnant nation. That's what we're looking at. That's why it's important to have an understanding of the figures of the truth. Because you're literally looking at what's taking place in the event in the book of Joshua. But it's a prophecy. Way down of what's going to be. So Joshua's generation is figurative of the conclusion of the remnant nation. The sons of Israel that will be born in a day. It will be finished. The reproach of Egypt, the world with its lust, will be rolled off that remnant. And they will be the first fruits offered unto God for a sweet savor offering in the kingdom. Okay. And all that will remain for them is to enter into the land of Canaan and receive their inheritance for an everlasting possession. This picture. Israel will be the first fruits of the sons of God in the kingdom with the promise of more to come. Okay. More sons of God in the future. Now, every act of obedience the nation has done in this military account of the book of Joshua is a figure of that which shall be. It is finished. It's a figure of the remnant nation Israel. Now, there are five sets of two of the figurative pictorial of it is finished. Five is the ordinal that speaks of grace, while the ordinal two is the ordinal of witness. So five times the finished work of the grace of the covenant son is witnessed to in the figurative pictorials before they go in and take Jericho. The first set of two are the 12 stones in Jordan. The nation has died with their savior, the covenant son. All things are passed away, and as a nation they have been raised to a new life. Born in a day, all things have become new, as the twelve stones at Gilgal declare. The second set of two are the great stones and the stone altar. The great stones in Mount Ebo, plastered with the law of the land, the Lord is sovereign, 
and the stone altar figuring the covenant son as the stone of Israel and the altar that's acceptable to God. Can you get this sense of establishing there's a kingdom that's being established, right? Then you have the third set of two. That's the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. Declaring the way of salvation to all the others that are going to be entering into the kingdom. Here is the way of salvation in the offering of himself, holy unto God. The covenant son made peace with God and provided the peace of God for man. Then we come to the fourth set of two. The ceremonial blessings and cursings upon the two mounts is seen figuratively in the name of the two mounts. Life under the sun, apart from receiving the seed of the eternal life, is a heap of nothing, a heap of confusion. That's the name of Mount Evil. But in the cutting off of the flesh, the cutters off, the name of Mount Gerizim, is the blessing of eternal life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now with the last set of two, the fifth set, the circumcision and Passover is the climax of grace, literally for the generation under Joshua and figuratively of the remnant nation. Mm -hmm. It's finished. And the reason we know that it's finished is because... The stars with their signs declare that in the first month. So you have basically a wrap-up in all the figuratives, right? It's finished. All that remains in Joshua from this point on is the receiving of the inheritance, which will begin with the taking of the city Jericho in chapter 6. Okay. Now, that concludes the lesson. <laughs> so what I would like for you to do for next week, please read Joshua 5, uh, the, the last three verses, 13 through 15, right? And read all of Joshua 6. And read it as often as you can. And like I said to our YouTube friends, there's a lot of figurative in there, but it's beautiful. And if you were an Israelite, you would understand what's being expressed. So I hope I haven't lost anybody, and thank you for hanging in with me, and amen in Jesus' name. Amen.